Oh, our next speaker is Nadia Linder. Uh, Nadia is a PhD student in Assyriology at the University of Vienna, whose PhD deals with Sumerian lexicography and semiotics with a side interest in early Mesopotamian religion. And her talk is The Legacy of the Golden Bough in the Interpretation of Early Sumerian Myth, the case study of Ninsumun and Lugalbanda. So Nadia, please take center stage. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm going to echo Professor Nissen and hear a little bit. The conference topic is wonderful and I'm really happy to be able to contribute. So yeah, um, I'll be talking about the intersection between the Golden Bow and early Mesopotamian, or specifically Sumerian myth. Fraser's Golden Bow has had a lasting influence on the study of religion and myth including that of early Mesopotamia. This latter influence can be difficult to detect. Some authors make use of the ideas presented in the Golden Bow without explicit reference or use normative comparisons similar to phrases. And doubtlessly, many such works have contributed greatly to understanding of Mesopotamian religion. However, I believe it is important that we become more conscious of the Golden Bow as an important element of the semiosphere in which interpreters of Mesopotamian myth and religion formulated their views. In this presentation, I will illustrate this inference with a case study of the old Sumerian myth Ninsumun and Lugalbanda. First, I will introduce the text and its protagonists, providing a short summary. Second, I will present two different interpretations of the myth, highlighting how they relate to the golden bow. And finally, I will offer a new interpretation of the first part of the text, which concerns the human divine union between a powerful goddess and a mortal hero. The myth was written down around 2600 BCE on a clay tablet at the site of Tel Abu Salabik in modern Iraq. And the narrative has drawn attention from scholars mainly due to its main protagonists, the goddess Ninsumum and the mythic hero Lugalbanda. Both are known from later stories as the parents of the famous Gilgamesh. So let me introduce them. First, Ninsumu. The standard lexicon of Assyriology does not tell us much about the goddess. She is characterized only by her functions as wife of Lugalbanda and mother of Gilgamesh. But I contend that the functions of wife and mother are not really what Ninsumu is about in this myth. In order to understand the idea complex behind the goddess, we have to look at her name. It consists of two Sumerian lexemes, Nin, lady, and Sumon, too, aurochs, and can thus be translated as lady aurochs cow. But we should bear in mind the reality of the aurochs as a large, wild, and dangerous animal that was still roaming the flanks of the Zagros and Taurus mountains at the time the myth was written down. The animal played a salient role in the religious practices of Southwest Asia from the Neolithic onwards, as can be seen from e.g. the impressive plaster horn curves at Chattal Höyük, which you can see here. And female aurochs have also been associated with shamanic practices. At the Natufian cave site Hilazon Techtit, the grave of an elderly and disabled woman was found. She was accompanied by grave goods consisting of a complete human foot, as well as various animal body parts, uh, including the tail of an aurochs cow. Uh, the burial has been interpreted as a shaman's grave by its excavators. Later in Sumerian literature, the aurochs cow remains a figure of power. Deities, both male and female, are likened to the animal, and the great Anunna gods are described as a herd of cattle whose leader Inanna, about whom we have heard earlier in her form as Ishtar, is described as an aurochs cow. And it is also of note that the name of Ninsumon is prefixed by the word Lamma in this myth. Lamma mm. is a term for the specific function of protection in liminal spaces in this period, and only goddesses that are associated with some sort of liminal concept or context can execute this function. So mm. this tells us that in this myth, Ninsumon is not just the lady aurochs cow. 
She is the Lama, Lady Orox Cow, a powerful goddess who offers protection in the liminal spaces she inhabits. As for Lugalbanda, the stories that have come down to us describe him as a cunning and wise man who mostly spends his time in the Kur, the mountain peaks that overlap with the netherworld. He's creative when it comes to problem solving, preferring to use his wits rather than hit things with weapons. He also appears as a somewhat shamanic character. In one story, he suffers an initiatory sickness after which he speaks to celestial deities to aid him against demons. And in another, he tricks a boon out of a nature spirit. So now that you have some idea about the protagonists of our myth, let's dive right in. Yes. The story begins in Medias Res with Lugalbanda once again in the Kur. There he has met Lama Ninsumun and presumably the two get along well. Ninsumun brings a substance called agarin, which both of them consume. Uh, it is emphasized that Ninsumun has great knowledge as she enters a trance state and lies down. Lugalbanda touches the goddess, and then kisses her eyes and lips before coming to know a great light. Afterwards, the goddess spreads out herbs and precious stones before the hero. They spend time among pleasant trees, and time passes. Later, our protagonists rest in Uruaza, a city in the eastern mountains. There, Lugalbanda, who now also possesses great knowledge, receives the Imru, um, a term which I will leave untranslated here. When next we meet our protagonists, they're already in a Sumerian city, probably Unuk, where Lugalbanda presents himself to the ruling Ain. The Ain requires Lugalbanda to show him what he has brought from the Kur and informs him that the Anunna have already prepared everything for him. Accompanied by Ninsumun, Lugalbanda enters the Gipar, which is the sacred precinct of the goddess Inanna. There, he gives the Imru as offerings to a lil spirit, which causes said Lil to enter the Gipar through an ablution pipe used in the cult of the dead. Laman in Sumon reacts quickly, sprinkling acacia oil and sacred water on the ground, while Lugalbanda is shaking with fear. Inanna then appears and addresses the intimidated hero. She acknowledges his relationship with Ninsumon and that he has become a family member. Finally, she blesses their child. I will now present two different interpretations of this myth, um, highlighting the different ways in which the influence of Fraser's golden bow can be felt in them. First, Torkel Jacobs' 1989 article, Lugalbanda and Ninsunna. In his interpretation of the myth, Lugalbanda is staying at the house of Ninsumon's parents. He has already paid the bride price for his, quote, child bride, unquote, and the formal and binding wedding ceremony has taken place. The little cherub Ninsumun is occupied with domestic tasks, making sweet confections for her husband. But then, instead of retiring for the night alone, Ninsumun shrewdly stays awake and seduces her husband, thus tricking him into consummating the marriage. When Lugalbanda has to leave for his home in Unuk, Ninsumun follows him to show her devotion. But in Unuk, disaster strikes. Lugalbanda had been sent by the Ain to collect tribute, but Lugalbanda used the tribute to pay for his child bride. Luckily, the hero's weapon intercedes with his dead mother, who fixes everything. Finally, blessings are invoked for Ninsumun's fertility. So, what is the Golden Bow's influence here? Excuse me. Broadly speaking, the reduction of the complex myth or God. Mm. Sorry. <clears throat> Broadly speaking, the reduction of the complex myth to a presumed underlying marriage ritual, including contract, ceremony, and finally consummation, reflects Jacobson's belief in the primacy of ritual before myth, for which the evolutionist model sketched in the Golden Bow is a prime example. I know I sound terrible now. <laughs> More specific, however, is the influence of Fraser's sacred marriage on Jacobson's reading of IAS 327. In the Golden Bow, the sacred marriage is the union between a great goddess of fertility and a mortal lover who eventually had to die a violent death. <laughs> Among Fraser's examples are the myths of Artemis and Hippolytus and Aphrodite and Adonis. 
In each case, the young lover dies a gruesome death, each an example of the young dying god. In Fraser's model, these myths had to reflect an original ritual, the union of a priest king with a goddess and his subsequent slaughter. This was meant to ensure good crops by the principle of sympathetic magic. In Fraser's telling, the story of the sacred marriage is one of underlying horror. The man fertilizes the earth with his semen, and after a set time, he's ritually slaughtered to give his very life and blood to the earth he was married to. Torkil Jakobsen adopted Fraser's model of the sacred marriage as ensuring fertility and good crops. According to him, this act was the central concern of early Sumerian religion, which he imagined as an all-encompassing fertility cult. Its divine participants were Inanna, whom we already have heard about, and the shepherd god Dumuzid, a young dying god, with priest king playing the role of Dumuzid in the cultic practice. However, since there are no early texts that would attest to such a practice, Jakobsen had to look elsewhere for evidence. He found it in the number of popular love songs from the first half of the second millennium BC, symbolized here. <laughs> Today, there's common consensus that these love songs are essentially the pop songs of ancient Mesopotamia, telling lighthearted and at times bawdy stories of young love, courtship and marriage. The names of Inanna and Dumuzid stand in for the names of any young couple in love. As these texts provided the coloring for Jakobsen's fertility cult, his reconstruction of it is accordingly on the more lighthearted side. He describes Inanna as a teenager with butterflies in her belly, gossiping with her friends and mortified at meeting her beloved without a chaperone. Their sacred marriage is celebrated in a very gentle and civil manner. So although Jacobson follows Fraser in assigning primary importance to an ancient fertility cult involving a sacred marriage between priest, king and goddess, the two flavors of this union could not differ more. Compare Fraser's, quote, bloody orgies of the Asiatic goddess and her consort, end quote, with Jakobsen's, quote, gently glowing sense of inner and outer bliss in trust and security, unquote. And it is this atmosphere of innocent joy and happiness that has directly influenced the way Jakobsen wrote about Ninsumon and Lugalbanda. He uses the model of his envisioned sacred marriage in early Suma as a blueprint through which he understands this myth. The goddess is an innocent young girl eager to please her husband and the domestic setting are both an echo of the pop songs that he built his sacred marriage on. On to Douglas Frayn's 1999 article, The Birth of Gilgamesh in Ancient Mesopotamian Art. As Frayn understood the text, Lamanin Sumon marries Lugalbanda, but instead of consummating the marriage, she stays awake and has intercourse with an incubus-like demon, the Lil. Her marriage to Lugalbanda primarily serves to legitimize her son, Gilgamesh. As nobody must know what happened, she gives birth in secret in a lattice patch and hides the infant in the clay pot. Back in Unuk with her cuckolded husband, she is interrogated about the clay pot she smuggled into the city and hastily throws it out of a window to protect the child's life. Inanna appears and announces that she wishes Gilgamesh to become her heir, and the clay pot with the infant hero is then somehow retrieved. The, here, the golden bow's influence is methodological in nature. The golden bow is an example for the use of normative comparisons in religious studies. Fraser's theories about the ritual at Nemi inform the way in which he interprets myths and religious phenomena. Vegetation deities are everywhere, and hidden violence lurks in the seemingly most innocent of rites. It has been observed that the normative approach ironically works similarly to Fraser's sympathetic magic. Even the slightest element of similarity can be enough for an assumption that A equals B. Frayn's interpretation of Ninsumun and Lugalbanda is informed by this methodological approach. It is also an attempt to harmonize two different traditions about the parentage of Gilgamesh, the traditional one in which he is the son of Lugalbanda and Ninsumun, and that of the Sumerian king list, which names a little spirit as Gilgamesh's father. 
Since IIS 327 includes Ninsumun, Lugalbanda, and a Lil spirit, Frayn aimed to fashion the myth into an Ur text from which the two different accounts were derived. In his interpretation, the closest reflection of this Ur text can be found in the Greek Alexander romance and in Elian on Gilgamos in De Natura Animalium. IIS 327 is but the starting point for a dizzying journey through iconography and myth. Determined to find evidence for Gil Gilgamesh as a hero exposed at birth, the author identifies his entirely hypothetical drama all across Southwest Asia and the Mediterranean. Instead of looking at the text as it is, it is seen only through a Greek lens darkly to conform to the grand hypothesis of the author. Okay. So now that I've highlighted how Fraser's work has influenced modern views of this myth, I try to offer a different perspective. I will focus here on the human divine union between Laman in Summon and Lugalbanda. And there are a few key elements of the text that may improve our understanding, which you can see here. The first is the sentence, Igi Mulib. The verb lib has been translated in a variety of ways by scholars. Sleepless, wakeful, dazed, in nominal use as referring to dream fantasies, a state of losing consciousness and illusions. What these translations have in common is that they describe states of consciousness that differ from the normal one. It appears that the Sumerian word covers a range of altered states, which is why I suggest the translation to be in a trance or to enter a trance. A description of such a state might be found in a later Sumerian myth known as Inanna in Shukalituda. A young man chews the roots of plants and proceeds to have visions of the cosmos and of shining gods towering up into the heavens what might very well be characterized as dream fantasies. As for the grammatical object, igi, eyes, it is the eyes of Ninsumun that appear to indicate her trance state. In later periods, the Sumerian designation for drug users is lu igi ningin, a person who rolls the eyes, which also focuses on the eyes as a visible symptom of intoxication, a concept still in use today. Compare also the votive statues of the same period as our myth. These depict women and men with hugely dilated pupils holding small vessels clasped before their chest. It has been suggested that their dilated pupils indicate the communion with the divine that may have been facilitated by the, consum by the consumption of a psychoactive drink served in these vessels. Which leads us to the word Agarin, the first word in the text, and therefore quite important. Agarin designates a spiced sourdough, probably liquid, that was used as an ingredient for brewing beer. In later periods, it can also mean womb or matrix. When we think of beer today, the liquid that comes to mind is very different to that of ancient Sumer. There were dozens of different beers that are impossible for us to define with any kind of certainty. Special ones were brewed for temples, festivals, rituals, etc. Consider that before the first Reinheitsgebote were instituted, it was common practice to add entheogens like belladonna and mandrake to beer. Indeed, it has been suggested that the leaves and flowers on the headdress from the royal tombs of Ur could represent members of the nightshade family, here for comparison, mandrake and belladonna. So we should thus be open to the possibility that the ingredients that went into the agarin may have included psychoactive substances. A key phrase in the first part of our text is the compound verb galzu, to be wise and to be knowledgeable. Notably, it is Ninsumon who is initially described as galzu. Lugalbanda, on the other hand, is only described as such after the union with Ninsumon. The use of utgalzu, to know a great light, might also suggest entoptic phenomena, uh, characteristic for the consumption of entheogens. Compare the entoptic imagery found on the somewhat earlier Kura Araxes ware from Anatolia, or on the Mesopotamian burnished ware cylinder seals dating from 3000 to 2600 BC. Further, it has been noted that the union between Ninsumon and Lugalbanda is described in unexpectedly gentle terms. Typically, Sumerian myths used to have intercourse or 
more explicit terms like to plow the vulva. This suggests to me that the conscious use of a language otherwise completely unknown for the description of sexual unions in Sumerian literature is intended to signify that this is not your typical plowing the vulva style kind of union. Taking these points together, I suggest that the union between Lamanin Sumun and Lugalbanda can be understood in a new light. First, the character of the wilderness of the Kur, the mountain peaks that overlap with the netherworld, needs to be taken into consideration. This part of the story takes place in a conceptual outside. Second, the character of Ninsumun as both Lady Oroch's cow and as Lama needs to be considered. A powerful and dangerous animal that has had huge symbolic significance in Southwest Asia since time immemorial, and a female protective entity associated with liminal spaces. This is a powerful and symbolically potent entity that operates in a liminal space, not a child bride baking cakes. And third, combining the possibility of the agarin having psychoactive ingredients, the trance state expressed by Igi Mulib, and the union between knowledge of a goddess and human hero, which results in the latter knowing a great light, might suggest that the union between goddess and mortal may have had an initiatory character. Note that there are several seal impressions of roughly the same period that show the heads of aurochs and humans complementing each other, melting into each other and forming intricate patterns. You can see here the protocuneiform signs for aurochs and human, which have been used by the ancient artists. Here, the union of human and aurochs is used as part of a symbol of authority over resources, which is quite important in early Sumer. So how is any of this useful? As I mentioned at the outset, the golden bow is an important element of the semiosphere in which interpreters of Mesopotamian myth and religion formulated their views. In the tapestry of scholarship, identifying that thread, which is the golden bow, can yield surprising results. To quote the browser game Fallen London, it's shocking how many assertions in modern scientific texts can be traced back to some 18th century gentleman farmer in Ipswich. I believe that our understanding of early Mesopotamian religion can be improved by identifying such assertions and by putting these academic hand-me-downs into context. This does indeed involve, as the game puts it, chasing down every last citation. And more importantly, becoming aware of those implicit assumptions that are not made explicit, never finding their way into a bibliography. Thank you.